Praise God. We're going to be in the book of Luke chapter 10. We're going to read verses 25 through 37. You know how sometimes my message is, like I know sometimes that I, the Lord puts a word on my heart. Well, let me just tell you how this message came about. You know how I've always told you, like, I never know how I'm going to get the idea from a message. About two weeks ago, we were praying in the back room, and Angie said in her prayer, pour in the oil and the wine. And when she said that, like the Holy Spirit said, you're going to preach on the Good Samaritan. And it was two weeks ago, because I didn't even preach last week, and... I really, I'm going to be honest with you, it's not like I've been looking at the story every day. I really haven't. I woke up really early yesterday morning, and I was like, I just can never, God is just so awesome. Amen? Amen. So one thing that I want to say, you know, a lot of times my titles, they start right off the bat by poking people. And I just want you to know this morning that when I poke you, I'm poking myself. Amen? Amen. And I also want you to, to know you're going to do yourself a great disservice if... You look out the corner of your eye at your partner and you think, mm -hmm, this message is for you. Because the reality of it is, this message is for all of us amen. this morning. Starting with the preacher, amen? amen? But this is the title of my message, Don't Fall Into Your Own Loophole. Don't fall into your own loophole. Let's read the scripture. It says in verse 25, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him. Who did he tempt? He tempted Jesus. And what it really means is he put him to the test. He asked, he's asking Jesus a question to put him to the test, to see like, what's really, what, what, what is your take on things? All right. And he says, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? You know, I was having a conversation with somebody the other day. This is so true. You ever been around people, and I know I've done it myself. I mean, I don't want to do it anymore, where they kind of tell you what you want to hear. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like they're telling you what you want to hear, but you know that in reality, on the flip side, they ain't really thinking what they're saying. Does that make sense? Yes. He's not really wanting to get the truth from Jesus. He's already got something fabricated in his mind, and he's really wanting to hear what it is that he wants to hear. But he says, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, Jesus said, what is written in the law? How readest thou? Now, listen, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but listen, this, this word lawyer right here is a lot different than our understanding of a lawyer. Our lawyers today understand laws regard, depending on what type of law that they practice, but many times they, they understand the, the civil laws that our society is governed by. And so they know the wordings of all of that, and they know what's right and wrong and legalities and whatnot, right? Okay, this is a little different because you see Israel was, their civil laws were based upon the law of Moses. And so this lawyer, what this means is he was an expert in the law of Moses. So what that really means is is that he was an expert in the word of God. Because when this is going on, the New Testament isn't written yet. Only the Old Testament is there. These people are Jewish. And so he's talking to Jesus. And so what I'm trying to tell you is this dude knew the Bible. He knew the Bible, or at least he knew the written word of the Bible. He had studied it. He had dissected it. He knew every little jot and tittle. And now he's going to put Jesus to the test. And Jesus said, well, how do you interpret it? I mean, how do you read the law? How, what is your understanding of it? And so he gives his response. He says, and he answering said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Before we even get to the next phrase, just think about that. I, I know that we all fall short in that area. We all want to, right? We all want to because we know that that's what we're supposed to do. But have you ever been in a place in your walk with God where you were really close to him? I mean, I just want you to reminisce backwards at the time frame, because each and every one of us in this place have been at times closer to the Lord than maybe at other times. Maybe right now is that time for you. I don't know. But think about when you were the closest to the Lord, how soft your heart was. Amen. How Because when, when your heart is soft towards God, the next part of the phrase is easy. Look what it says. And, and, and you shall also love your neighbor. As yourself. You know, for the most part, people don't go around hurting themselves. For the most part, I mean, yeah, it does happen, but we won't get into that right now because that's not the point. But you know, you're not going to normally take a hammer and smash your own finger. 
You know, you're not gonna hurt yourself like that. Why? Because you kind of like, in a way, you kind of like love yourself. You don't want, you don't want to do that. Well, so you're not gonna want to turn around and hurt your neighbor. And if your heart is right towards the Lord, and you're humble in your heart and in your mind towards God, and you understand the fact that even the breath in your lungs does not belong to you because you were bought with a price. Hallelujah! You were redeemed with the precious blood of a lamb, which was foreordained before the foundation of the earth. The Lord wants to give you a revelation. He wants to give me a revelation that he's had a plan in place and it was to send us Jesus. Oh, we're going to get into it a little bit this morning. But it was to send us Jesus when we least deserved it and that's what God did for you and I. Think of what he did for you and I. I was talking... I was talking to Robert this morning, you know, and I was just like, dude, dude how many times have we done God wrong? Yeah, How many times have we done God wrong? And yet at the same time, he said, the father sent his son to die for us. But we forget that. We forget the mercy and the graciousness of God and how good he's been to us. Amen. All right, let's keep going. He says, he's, and he says, love your neighbor as yourself. And he said unto him, you have answered right. Jesus is like, man, you got it. You hit the nail on the head. You were, you were perfect in your interpretation. And look at this. He says, he says, you have answered right. This do and you shall live. But look at this. Look at this. Is this something? Verse 29. But he willing to justify himself. A loophole. I got dude, I got to find me a loophole because I'm not really liking what you're telling me. Because I'm going to be honest with you. If my neighbor does me wrong, I want to be able to smash his finger even though I don't want to smash my own finger. I'm trying to make a point. I'm trying to make a point that sometimes in life, People make decisions, and listen, if we're not careful, bitterness will take root in our heart, frustration will overwhelm us, and we won't be able to see clearly the way that Jesus loves us, amen? Amen. He willing to justify himself said to Jesus, well, who's my neighbor? Jesus is like, man, you done read all that Old Testament over and over, and you don't know the heart of God? Okay. But this is what he says. This is how Jesus answered him. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite. When he was at the place, he came and looked on him. He at least came across the street and he looked at him and he passed by on the other side. He's like, nope, don't want none of this. But a certain Samaritan, we're going to get into it. As he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to it to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow or the next morning, when he departed, he took out two pence and he gave them to the host of the inn. And he said unto him, take care of him. And whatsoever you spend more, when I come again, I will repay you. Which now of these three do you think was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do likewise. Amen. Father, help us to be able to see the word that you're speaking this morning. You know, the overall essence of this story, at least the context, uh, with with this religious man, again, that that I saw, that the Lord allowed me to see, was that he was looking for a loophole. Because the Bible straight up exposed him and said, he trying to justify himself. And so he was looking for a loophole. In other words, he knew what was right. He's just looking for a way to wiggle out of doing what was right. That, that's what he's doing. He's trying to look for a way to wiggle out of doing what is right. If you're saved this morning, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I keep saying that, but I, but I think I'm going to. If you're saved this morning, then the Holy Spirit lives in your heart. Hallelujah. And if you will listen yes. to the Holy Ghost, and if you will apply yourself to a study of the word, I'm telling you right now, the Holy Spirit will reveal to you what is right in situations. Amen? Amen. Now. Ain't none of us going to get it right all the time. Come on, somebody. Help me out. We're falling. But that's not an excuse. I was saying this morning to somebody also, like, you know, I can remember when people used to say, but look how Jesus handled this. 
And you know what my response used to be? Yeah, but he was Jesus. I was looking for a loophole. I was looking for a way to wiggle out. No, the same spirit that raised him from the dead dwells in you. Hallelujah. And can bring life to your mortal body. And that's what the gospel teaches is that he is trying to that same spirit to teach us the ways of the Lord. Amen. Amen. To change our mindsets, to change our hearts. How are we going to be any different than the world if we don't let God do a work in our heart? Amen. Amen. So he's looking for a way to wiggle out of what's right. The Bible specifically says that he wanted to justify himself. He was a lawyer. He understood the law of Moses. He was an expert in the word. And this has always been a problem with God's people or even people in the world. If it's not convenient for them, if it's not what they're looking, they're looking for a loophole. I'm, I'm just talking about, and that go, I'm, again, don't look at your neighbor out the corner of your eye because this is for everybody. We all got this little thing in us that's looking for a, a, some wiggle room so that we can justify the actions that we've made. And it, it goes on to say, that I, I wrote, and the decisions that we will make in those situations, when we're not humbling ourselves, it, you know how it's always going to be better for us in that situation. You know what I'm saying? Whenever we make decisions... That, that in the end are always better for us. We're always putting ourselves first. Listen, if you came this morning and you was expecting to hear a message that was only going to make you feel better, then I'm telling you right now, you came to the wrong place. Hello. A lot of times people in the church, that's what they want. They want a message that's going to motivate them, to, that's going to make them feel a, a lot better about themselves. But the Lord wants to reveal ourselves to us. Amen? Yes. Amen. I don't know what else to say. A huge part of living Christianity instructs us to stop making decisions in a way that it's always best for us, even though it may not be good for someone else. Let's look at Philippians chapter two, verses four through nine. Philippians two, four through nine. Look what it says right here. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. What does that mean? Well, first off, he's saying he's wanting the same mind that was in Jesus to be in you. And he's saying that even though Jesus was originally in the form of God, meaning he was in heaven before he ever became a man. Jesus is the eternally existent one. Okay, I'm just using a bunch of fancy words, but I want you to understand what I'm saying. He's the eternal son. He's the eternal lamb. He is the eternal word. God the Father didn't create Jesus. Jesus was already the word from the beginning of time. Amen. And there is a Godhead. Hallelujah. There is something called a Trinity, meaning there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But they've always been Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, that's bigger than I can think. Okay, it kind of is for me too, but just trust me when I tell you that Jesus was the word that spoke the worlds into existence. And then the eternal word clothed himself in flesh because that was the father's will. The father's will was that, that a man would die for the sins of the people. But when he looked abroad, there was no man that could die for the sins of the people because the wages of sin is death and all were sinners. Therefore, God himself would have to become a man so that the sinless one, hallelujah, could die in place of the sinful ones. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he was in glory. He was in the form of God. But this is what he did. He thought it not. Another translation says this. He didn't think that it was something to be held on to. In other words, his position is God. Jesus did not take the position and say, well, let me just tell you, Father, I don't want to do that. Because look, <laughs> Look how these look how these people are acting down there anyway. They're, nobody's going to appreciate what you're about to do for them. They're going to spit on me. They're going to pull the beard out of my face. They're going to thrust the thorn of crowns upon my head. They're going to mock me. They're going to ridicule me. I, to be honest with you, and they're not going to appreciate what I'm going to do for them anyway. So to be honest with you, I don't really want that job. Why don't you give that to the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Why don't you let him become man? And deal with all that. No, that's not what Jesus did. He did not consider it 
something to be held on to. I'm talking about his position. But what he did was he made himself of no reputation, verse 7. He took upon him the form of a servant. That's talking about his incarnation. That's talking about the fact that he became a human being. And he was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Hallelujah. He was God. He became a man. He died as a man. He resurrected. Now he's in a glorified state. He's seated at the right hand of the Father and he ever liveth to make intercession for you. Hallelujah. The wrong way to interpret that is, man, if I just do God's will, I'm going to get exalted. Come on, church. Hello. Don't miss the big picture here to be thinking, if I'll just do God's will, I'm going to be exalted. It ain't about exalting you and me. It's about Jesus being exalted and about Him being exalted in our lives. And when we allow the Holy Spirit to do the same in us, where we humble ourselves and we lower ourselves according to God's will, then He does a work in the inside of our life. And Jesus is exalted. And yes, can I tell you, on the back end, you get blessed. Yeah. Can I tell you that he will bless you on this earth also? Yeah. Amen. That is, but, the, but if your motives are, I'm going to do this so that I get blessed, you, you got it, we got it all wrong. Right. Yeah. The, the right interpretation is that Jesus selflessly lowered himself and became a man so he could die for our sins. He did that for us. He was obedient to the Father's will, and the result was that he was exalted. You know, there's a spiritual truth here, though, for every believer. And it, but it requires a serious point of faith. Sometimes I feel like I use so many words that we just get lost in the midst of it and we don't get, get the take home message. I'm here to tell you, you need to hear this right now because this is something that can transform your life. It requires a point of faith, a willingness to do God's will His way and believing that if I do it God's way, he will, he will take care of me. That's right. Even though it doesn't make sense. Amen. If I will do it God's way, he will take care of me. That, listen, when everything else is falling around about you, right? Everything's not, nothing's going the way that you would have expected it to. Sometimes it's because we've all opened up our own doors. Sometimes it's because we've been disobedient. Sometimes it's like the, the trial of Job. God allows something to happen to test our faith because he's wanting us to hold on to him, to stay focused on him. Hallelujah. But it's going to require faith to believe that if I will let him be my defender, if I will let him go before me, if I will do it his way, if I will humble myself and allow him to have his way, he will take care of me. And in the end, he, I, hallelujah, he's going to do a good work in me. Thank you, Jesus. But you know what it takes? Sometimes it takes things in our life to make us realize that. He's going to take care of me. Did you know that God sees what God sees as what's best for you isn't always what you see what's best for you. Amen. Right. <laughs> I mean, because sometimes I'm like, how could this be God's will? Oh, don't worry. You, had, <laughs> you might have had some stuff in you that you didn't even know was there. That's why the Bible says don't think more highly of yourself than what you are. We walk around this mug, <laughs> this mug, I was about to say, we walk around this place. Thinking that we got it all figured out and that, and, that, and that we really a whole lot. You know, Brother Larson used to say it a lot. A lot. He used to say, we're a whole lot more flesh than we are faith. Yeah. We give ourselves way too much credit. <laughs> we think that we all walking in faith and the reality of it is, is that a lot of times we operate in the flesh. Yeah. And we think, it, but it's because we want things to go our way. Lord, help us. The opposite of this thought. Oh, here I wanted to say this. It's not brainwashing what I'm talking about. It's called washing the brain. God wants to teach us through his word and the Holy Spirit to think like him. He wants his people to think like him. He wants his people to act like him. Sorry, church, we can't get away from that. And if we're going to say that we got a revelation of a message of the cross, I'm just saying, believe me, I'm preaching to myself this morning. Just trust me. If we're going to say we got some kind of special revelation about a message of the cross that... What, that what we're saying about that is, is that this is the essence of that, is that Jesus's work is a finished work and that when he died and he paid the penalty of our sin, it not only gets us to be able to go to heaven. 
but it opens up the door and gives us access to the grace of the Holy Spirit. And whenever we believe that way daily, the Holy Spirit, like medicine to our broken bones, is healing us, changing us, and making us look more like Jesus. If we believe that we have such revelation that I speak of, then it ought to be changing us. It ought to be like medicine to our broken bones and making us look different to the world out there. Does that make sense? Praise God. Hallelujah. But the opposite of that thought is like the lawyer. I know what's right versus what's wrong. And instead of doing what's right, I find a loophole in order to justify my actions because I want to do what's best for me. No, if you're saved and the spirit of God lives in you. Look at Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. I said, if you're saved this morning, the Holy Ghost lives on the inside of you. Amen. Amen. What does it mean to be saved? Uh, we might have somebody watching on video. We might have somebody walked into church this morning. What does it mean to be saved? You were born the first time in Adam. You were born guilty and in sin. You were born condemned. But God, hallelujah, had a plan and he sent Jesus to die on the cross for your sin. And when the truth of the word goes forth and says you ain't going to work your way into my presence, brothers, it's uh, child of God or daughter, son, however God would say it. You're not going to work your way into my presence. You can't go to church enough. You can't get involved in the ministry. You can't read your Bible enough. You can't pray enough. No, you need to understand that you are completely broken and undone. And I sent my son Jesus to die for you. And when you accept that by faith, hallelujah, I'm not talking about just in your mind, I'm talking about in your heart. When you believe in your heart, what does that mean? Are you talking about that muscle that pumps blood in your body? No, that's physiology, that's anatomy. I'm talking about spirituality. The inner man, when the inner man that was stamped by God that says you belong to me, it's what makes you different than that cute little dog you got at home. I hope they go to heaven, but I've got to tell you, (laughs) I just don't know. But one thing I'll tell you is that I would have never even said that before in the past. But one thing I will tell you is this. I know that that God has stamped upon my heart the fact that I am an intellectual, I'm a mortal being, I'm a God-conscious being, and I'm going to spend eternity somewhere. Hallelujah. Help us, Lord. When you hear that word go forth, that's called the gospel, that's called the good news, and you, my friend, whoever you are, wherever you are, you better believe that from your heart, from your inner being. Don't just say, yes, you must confess it with your mouth, but you must believe it in your heart. And when God knows that you're lining up with Him, that's the trick right there. You can't, don't try to look for no loophole when it comes to salvation, my friend. It don't work like that. God knows the intents and the motives of the heart. You know, yes, maybe you meant business when you was in vacation Bible school at 10 years old. And if you did, God knows it and you're saved. But if you was just going along because your five of your friends went up to the front and you just playing the game, God ain't. No, it don't work like that. You got to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. And when you line up, according to God, a miracle happens. Amen. This is what I'm trying to read to you right now in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. This is the miracle that happens when you get saved. You ready? In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest, that means the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. (laughs) Some would say, well, I thought I was already redeemed. Well, you are, but it's talking about in the final day. There's a, you know, you know, you are already redeemed when Jesus shed his blood, but there's coming a day when it's going to be finalized. Amen. And that possession is going to be the the redemption is going to be made final and you're going to receive a glorified body. Hallelujah. But until that time, you got a down payment. You have a down payment. You know, the old pre- sister Tut, I got saved under her, uh, under her ministry. And, she, and I never knew what she meant back when she was saying it. I don't know. I guess she explained it. I don't know. But she, I can remember her saying it right now. When you know that you know that you know that you know. Well, what you talking about, sister? Because when the earnest of the Holy Ghost seals you when you get saved, then it bears witness with your spirit. His spirit bears witness with your spirit. And you know that you know that you know that you know that you're saved because you think you're different than you used to think. And you never would have produced those thoughts on your own. The Holy Spirit wants to change you. 
Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Do you know that this morning? Yeah. Do you know that this morning? <laughs> How you saved? Have you been sealed with the Holy Ghost? With the promise of truth? Hallelujah. Yes. Thank yes. you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And if he lives in you, he speaks to you. And this is what he says. Romans chapter 12, verse 10. We're going back to, let's not fall in a loophole. This is what it says in Romans 12, 10. It says, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. Amen. Again, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, considered it not robbery, but instead what he did was he lowered himself to he could become a servant. And the way that he served was he laid his life down so that others could have life. When the same Holy Spirit lives in you that, that, that it comes from God, then you know what he does? He makes decisions. He teaches you and I to make decisions that, that choices that... We're aware of how it's going to affect other people. Right. We're not just making choices for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Another way to say it is like this. If you're supposed to love your brothers and sisters in the Lord, and if you love them, then you need to think about how your actions are going to affect them. Mm -hmm. That's the essence of motives that caused Jesus to tell the story of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now I want to dig a little bit deeper into the parable because you see on the surface it's a story about an unlikely person helping someone when others wouldn't. If you could imagine the bitterness and hate, in order for me to give you the context of what's really going on here, I need you to imagine the bitterness and hatred of racism at its worst. I mean, I'm talking about at its worst. I've been around some racist people. And the, the bitterness that's on the inside, it's a spiritual, it's a demonic attack. You're not going to be able to fix that any other way than, than Jesus fixing somebody's heart. I'm not saying that we shouldn't try to fix it. But I'm just telling you, until Jesus changes a heart, you can't fix it. That's what was going on in this time frame. It's way too long of a story to try to really explain to you all the deep details of the Samaritans with the Jews. But, you know, I'll, I'll just draw you a map and I'll just try to explain it real quick like this. This is, this is the little map that I always draw of Israel, right? This is the Mediterranean Sea, Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea. This right here is Israel, all right? This strip of land is Israel. And Samaria was about right here. Jerusalem was about right here. Galilee, where Jesus this was Nazareth and all of this is the area of Galilee, okay? The Samaritans were right smack dab in the middle. It goes all the way back to the book of the Kings. But to make a long story short, basically the Samaritans, I guess you could say, were kind of like, half, they were half-breeds, if we could say it like that. Meaning, they were part Jew, but then they were part something else. It was a bunch of intermingling. They didn't even believe in the whole Bible. They just believed in the first five books of the Bible. If you go back and you look at John 5, Jesus had a conversation with a Samaritan woman. Jesus said, you err because you don't know the scriptures. You know, you, I mean, he, it, Jesus sometimes will tell you like it is. Yeah. You're over here trying to make an argument, but you don't even understand the scriptures. Right. If you understood them properly, then you would understand some things. But, but anyway, the hatred between the Samaritans and the Jews was very real. And let me tell you why a big part of it was. These Jewish people down here, they were very hypocritical. They were very self-righteous. And they looked down because they thought they were the only people that knew God. They were the people of God. But listen, don't you know that sometimes the people of God become very self-righteous? Mm -hmm. yeah. And they constantly downgraded the Samaritans. Made them feel less than. And so there was a lot of hatred that was built up between these people. So on the surface, I want you to see that the story is about an unlikely person that comes to help. But spiritually, I'm seeing a whole lot of other things going on here. You know, in many ways, people feel the same way about the truth of God. Yes, much of the world says that they love God, right? right. But if God isn't painted in a picture the way they want him to look, then now all of a sudden they don't really like God that much anymore. Just like the Jews didn't like the Samaritans. Yes, I want God, but I want God to look the way I want him to look. You know, sometimes people, there may be a day whenever they pull something like this off of Facebook, but as far as I know right now, they're not going to do it. There's only one God, church. Amen. Just by the thought that we're even going to believe that there's a God, there's a, there can only be one God. Hannah 
wrote something, wrote an Isaiah passage on the board for the kids in there. He said, basically it said, I am the Lord your God and I will share no, my glory with no other God or no graven images. I'm here to tell you, there's one God. Amen. And when I have conversations with people, I'm like, we might not agree on who that God is, but I know for a fact, I hadn't read your whole book, but I know for a fact that you believe there's only one God too. And we got us a problem because we also know we ain't in agreement on who God is. We can sit here and act all civil, but the reality, and then let us act civil because I ain't trying to get no religious war with nobody. But I will tell the truth that one of us is wrong. Come on, somebody. One of us is wrong. And, and, and the one that sent his son Jesus to die, hallelujah, sounds like the right one to me. Because what it does is, is it doesn't elevate man, it elevates God. And it tells us that man needed redemption from his sin. So, but if you don't paint God in the picture, and, then, and that's just other religions. But the reality of it is, is that even within the church. Yes. If the, if the God that I serve doesn't serve my needs, come on somebody, I mean I'm just going to speak in broad terms, the word of faith movement that came through the church. Mm -hmm. This God right here, if you spoke, if you confessed it, then you would possess it. Mm -hmm. If you named it, if you claimed it and named it, then yeah, it was yours. And you were going to manipulate the God of glory and that you were going to hold him to his word. And if you said all the right stuff, he was going to bless you. You were going to drive big cars. You were going to wear nice clothes. That's not the, re that's not the real God. Amen. That's not the real Jesus. Amen? Amen. So I guess the main point that I'm trying to make right there is that the fall of man has put man in a place of hostility towards God. Where his mind and his ways are hostile towards the will of God. And that brings me to my first point. You ready? Point number one, talking about this man right now. I'm talking about this man that got beat up. He left the high place. He left the high place. What are you talking about? Look at verse 30 of Luke chapter 10. It says, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, I got to tell you something. Jericho was actually, I'm not exactly sure. I didn't go back and look at a map, but it was actually north of Jerusalem. So how you go down from Jerusalem to Jericho? Because, because Jerusalem was built on a hill. So in height, what basically what we're saying is this man descended. He left an elevated place to go to a lower place. Spiritually speaking, what I'm trying to tell you is this. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now when I draw the stick man and I'll tell you that the first time you were born of Adam, right? Let's go ahead and do that for the people watching on video. When I, when I draw the stick man and I draw for you Adam and I draw for you, these are supposed to be X eyes where he's dead, right? You're born in sin and then you heard the good news of, of the gospel and by faith you believed in Jesus. Then what ended up happening is, is that God put you in Christ. That's the main point that I'm trying to make right here. He put you in Christ. And in God's mind, you became one with Jesus in his death, his burial, and his resurrection from the dead. God allowed you to have the righteousness of Jesus. And now God sees you differently than he used to see you. He sees you as though you're already where Jesus is. Amen. He sees you as though you're already, you're in Christ, and Christ is seated in heavenly places. That's how God would prefer that we view our life. That's how God would, that's God's will for you and I to be able to, to think in a heavenly realm, to think like him, amen, even though we're really still down here. It's understandable that we're still going to go through the trials of life. It's understandable that sometimes we're, we're not going to always get it right, right? But I want you to see something on this man. He was in Jerusalem. You know what Jerusalem means? Anybody shout it out there. What does it mean? Peace. Shalom. Jerusalem. It means peace. The, the name Jerusalem means peace. He left an ascended place. He left the, peace, the place of peace and he went downwards. And what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that as a, in a spiritual sense, you and I through attitudes, 
through sinful choices, can make a choice to go in another direction that descends us from the place of peace of God into another place that opens us up for an attack from the enemy. Now look, that brings me to point number two. The thief will leave you naked. Yep. Amen. I want you to know that. The thief will leave you naked. So listen, not only was Jerusalem built on a hill, but it was also very rocky terrain over there. Meaning... It was like mountain. You ever been in the mountains before? You ever, I mean, some mountains are made out of dirt. Some mountains are made out of rocks. But if you've ever been like in a hilly country where there's rocky terrain, that's how it was here. And it's important for us to understand. Even the Apostle Paul, I wrote the scripture down, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty five. He explains to us that this very thing happened to him. This was a common occurrence where when you were traveling by yourself, descending from Jerusalem and going wherever and walking through these rocky pathways, there would be little cracks in the rocks. There would be holes, little caves, and the thieves would hide up in there. And then whenever they saw you were by yourself, they'd jump out, they'd beat you up. They Listen, it happened to Paul. They took his clothes from him. they steal your clothes, man. The devil, the thief of your soul will leave you naked is the point that I'm trying to make. He, listen, I'm not even preaching about the fact that he'll leave you half dead, bleeding and dying on the Jericho Road. You open up doors and you descend from the high place, the place of peace, and you go downwards. You open up a door. The enemy of your soul will leave you wounded and bleeding and dying on the Jericho Road. Amen. But that's not even what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your raiment. I'm talking about the enemy will try, the thief will try to steal your clothing, church. Yeah. That's what they did to this man. Because, see, that's what the Word of God says, that the thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But that Jesus has come that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. The thief stole his clothes. Let's look at Revelation 3, 17 and 18 so that we can get a little bit of a better idea of what I'm trying to talk to you about regarding the clothing all right you ready revelation 3 17 and 18 says this this is jesus talking to it to the laodicean church and he says you say i am rich and increased with goods and i have need of nothing and look at this he's basically jesus is saying you think that you're doing good yeah. but this is what i say you don't even know that you're wretched yeah. you're miserable you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. Now, this is what I counsel you. This is what Jesus would tell each and every one of us if we're in a place where we think that, we, that we're in a good place and we're really not, right? He's, and then listen, at every last one of us, at some point in time in our walk, we, we can be there. But this is what he says. I counsel you to buy of me gold that's tried in the fire, and that you may be rich and white raiment, that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness would not appear and anoint your eyes with eye salves that you may see. There's a lot there, but I want to focus on the clothing. Because what he's talking about is not being exposed. What he's talking about is because of the fall of mankind, all of a sudden Adam and Eve realized they were naked. And throughout the whole of scripture, God has been preparing us a garment of clothes. And the garment of clothes that he's prepared, as I'm about to show you in the scripture, is the righteousness of Jesus. The enemy, the thief of your soul, wants to steal your clothes. I'm not even talking about the fact that he wants to really expose you. He wants to expose me. Whenever there's, a, whenever there's something that's going on that the enemy comes and he tempts us. Come on, somebody. You know, it's not God's will for you to expose your brother. Did you know that? It's not God's will for you to expose your brother. It's just not. God's will is that you would cover a fault in love. Uh, but you do what you want with that, but I can give you scriptural precedence for that. God's will is that you would cover your brother's fault in love because you want God to cover your fault in love, don't you? You don't want everybody brought in. Come on, somebody, help me out here. You, you don't want, no, no, you don't want people to start digging all up in your stuff. You don't want them to unlock the key and open up the door and look, look, look at this. Look what we found here. That's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to expose you. He wants to leave you naked. He wants to leave you full of shame and condemnation and guilt. And he wants to bring you to a place where you feel unworthy. Where you feel unworthy to come back to God. I'm here to tell you that the devil is a liar. He's a thief. He's a liar. He only wants to steal from you. But he's trying to steal your raiment. That's what I really want to focus on. I don't even want to focus on that exposure of sin. That's not what I'm talking about. 
I'm talking about He wants to take your righteousness from you. He wants to take your understanding of righteousness from you. Because we all fall short of the glory of God. But if we can understand what righteousness really looks like to God, and we can understand that God gave us that as a gift, and we can hold on to that, guess what happens? That grace that I'm telling you about, about the message of the cross, that finished work of Christ, grace that we keep talking about, or I try to keep talking about, guess what happens? When you understand that you're righteous because of His work and not your work, it allows the grace of God to keep flowing in your life. But as soon as you start elevating yourself, and you start thinking that way of yourself. Guess what happens? Uh-oh, you're starting to tighten up the valve. A little bit less grace. You're going to start walking in your own strength. That's not good. All right. Let's look at this right here. What Jesus is talking about right here is the covering of righteousness, righteousness that we receive from God as a gift of faith. Let's look at Revelation 19, 7 through 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Now, don't you know, I hope you already know, you've been coming to this church long enough, even if you've only been here twice, you already know this. You ain't getting in on your own righteousness. Right, brothers and sisters? Because if that be the case, we in a world of hurting. But no, we're getting in on the righteousness of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And when we put faith in Christ, hallelujah, we were clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. Look at Galatians 3 and 27. It says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ Jesus have put on Christ. Now, I got to tell you, don't think, oh, well, that, that happened to me a long time ago. I got baptized a long time ago. That's not what it's talking about. This word in the Greek is not talking about water. What we're talking about here is that when you believed, like I was telling you earlier, by faith in your heart, the Holy Spirit baptized you. I don't have time to break down the Greek right now. I just don't have time because, because of the, the time frame of the message. But, but what I want you to understand is, is that it's talking about a spiritual baptism. The word baptized means to be immersed into something. And it's not talking about water right here. Yes, you can be immersed into water. But what the scripture is talking about is that the Holy Spirit immersed you into Christ. And now you've become one with him. And now you're clothed with him. And now that you're clothed with Jesus, hallelujah, you're clothed with his righteousness. Amen. I want to I show you what the gift of God is. Look at Romans 5, 17. We're talking about the enemy trying to steal your clothes. It says, for if by one man's offense, death reigned by one. Adam, Adam's sin caused the world of hurt for mankind, right? Much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. The main, this doesn't even do the scripture justice. In the book of Romans chapter 5, five different times the word gift is used. He finally reveals to us what it is right here. It's righteousness. The gift of God. Is righteousness. Amen. It's a gift that was given to you by the Father. It's a gift that Jesus gave to you, made available for you when he went to the cross and died. Amen? Amen. The devil wants to steal from you the revelation that you are righteous in the eyes of God because of the sacrifice of Jesus. He wants to steal that from you because if you hold on to that and you really believe that, then grace, again, from the Holy Spirit will flow strengthen you, change you, amen, and encourage you even in the worst of situations. So I got good news for you this morning, church. Even though the enemy wants to try to steal your clothes, there is a good Samaritan, amen? But before we get to him, I got to tell you, point number three, you and I, we need to quit expecting something from people that we're not going to get. Come on, somebody. Amen. I've been preaching this for a long time. We got to quit expecting to get from people. You know, Danielle brought up the other day, you know, Matt, you've been through a lot of rejection since you started walking with the Lord. You got rejected over here. You got rejected over there. People over here saying this about this and da, 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 da. And through the course of time, I've watched how you just don't really seem to allow it to affect you the way it used to. I'm like, dude, the only one that I know that's good all the time is the Lord. I, I don't see too many times whenever people jack me around. And I don't even get, I thank Jesus that 
but I don't usually, yeah, I might get frustrated at the moment, but I don't hold on to that stuff. And I'm telling you, that's the Lord, because back in the day, dude, I'd be stewing it, and I'd be so frustrated. I'd be like, no, I'm about to get my day in court, buddy, and you're about to get told about yourself. But you know what? That's not going to fix nothing. Amen. That's not going to fix nothing. I've gotten to the point, though. I'm just being honest with you. And if you can let the Holy Spirit reveal this to you, I think it'll help you. Quit expecting something from people that you're not going to get. Amen. Because guess what? They're people. Right. And I go back to what I said in the beginning of the message. How many times did we let the Lord down? And yet he was still faithful to us. Right. Have you, and I put this in my, in my message. Have you forgotten all the wrong that, that we have done? Have we forgotten how many times we failed someone else? And now we're surprised when others fail us? Because, see, the scripture that I'm talking about right here is verse 31 of chapter uh, Luke 10. And by chance there came down a certain priest. I'm just preaching the word. By chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. See, you know what? What is a Levite? Well, let me just say this. All priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. Let's just do Sunday school real quick. You know who the fourth offspring of Jacob and, Le and, and Leah was? Levi. Levi. No, that was Judah. The third offspring of Jacob and Leah was Levi. I'm pretty sure it was the third. Go back and check me. If I was wrong, <laughs> we'll correct me. Third offspring, Levi. Who was Levi? The tribe of Levi is where the priests come from. Tri fast forward about 400 years or so, and you can have Moses and Aaron. Born of the tribe of Levi. From the tribe of Levi came the Aaronic priesthood. So every priest was a Levite, but not every Levite was a priest. So what does that mean for me in today's world, preacher? I'm going to tell you what it means. Out of all the people at this time that you would have expected to do the right thing, was a Levite and a priest. <laughs> a Levite did the work of the Lord. He handled all the stuff of the tabernacle. He picked it up. He tore it down. He carried it around. He did all the, the work. Uh, the, you know what I'm saying? And the priest did the intercession for the people. He provided all the sacrifice. The point that I'm trying to make is, is the very people that you would have expected to do the right thing. One of them even went over there and he looked at it like, nope, don't want to get involved with this. And he turned over to the other thing and he kept on going. We need to quit expecting people to do the right. Now, what the Lord would expect you to do is to do the right thing. Amen. That, that's the point that I'm always trying to make. There's always a balance to it. The Lord expects you to do the right thing because you belong to him and his spirit lives on the inside of you. But at the same time, you got to quit expecting that everybody's going to do the right thing. That's right. You're going to save yourself a whole lot of heartache. Amen. You're going to save yourself a whole lot of pain. How many times have you been coming to this church? Have I preached to you? Have you ever been hurt by somebody in the church before? Yeah. And whenever they would say, oh, I don't think I have. Okay, hold on, buddy. <laughs> hold on, buddy, because it's about to happen. Somebody's going to hurt you. Yeah. And sometimes it's not even that they really did. I mean, sometimes, yes, they did something. But sometimes it's not even. Well, Angie said it Wednesday night. It was a good little joke. But it's true. Oh, Pastor Matt, she used me as an example because I think she was trying to help me out with y'all. Pastor Matt didn't even tell me hi. Oh, he's so, you know, dude, if I don't tell you hi, it ain't because I don't love you. It might be because something happened. I don't know. I might have my mind somewhere else. I'm sorry if I don't tell you hi and tell you that I love you. I try real hard because you know why? I'm going off on a rabbit trail, but when I used to go to Cornerstone, I was so hard-hearted. In sin. After the Lord got a hold of me and I had even left that church, I was walking, doing something, and the Lord reminded me of one instance. I don't even know who that person was. Where I was walking up the aisle and they looked at me and smiled and I just kept walking. Mm -hmm. That's really not my personality. I'm, a per I'm not really like that. Like some people are just not real social. That's not really how I am. I was bound up in sin. Mm -hmm. And you know what I learned? I learned through the process of time that as the Holy Spirit softens my heart, that it is very important that people don't take me the wrong way. Right. Because, see, when they take me the wrong way, and I try so hard. 
I try hard, man. I still fall short, but I try hard. You know why? I try so hard. You know why I preface half the sentences I speak to you whenever I say, hey, man, I'm not trying to come across the wrong way. Or I'm, you, you know why I do that? Because I'm trying as hard as I possibly can in my human strength with some help from God not to lead you down the wrong path and make you think that I'm against you. And I don't, do you think that I want to? Yes, I do, because I'm representing Jesus. Amen? I'm here to represent Jesus. You're here to represent Jesus. And we need to make sure that we realize, right, of how our actions affect other people. What you expect, it means that the very ones that we expect to do right are oftentimes the very ones that will let us down. And if we get confused between man and God, then we will become bitter and blame God for people's actions that hurt you. And that's not really what's going on. You're not, you don't war against flesh and blood. You war against principalities and, 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 and powers and spiritual wickedness and high places and world rulers. I'm telling you, it's a spiritual battle. Amen. 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 And the enemy wants to use people. And he's used every last one of us in this room in a negative way to cause frustration in other people's lives. Yeah. Now I want to shift gears on that. I'm about to close. You ready? Point number four. He is the good one. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Let's quit expecting others to do the right thing, even though you, God expects you and I to do the right thing. Amen? But he's the good one. It says in verse 33, But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wound, wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn. And took care of him. It's hard to really see this if you don't understand, again, the backstory, but I've already explained it to you about the Samaritans and the hatred between the two. And the two people that you would have expected that would have helped went on their merry way. And here comes this Samaritan. You know, this is Jesus. Yeah. Je Jesus found you. I was, I told Danielle yesterday when I was preaching on, she said, you've been singing that song all week. He, <laughs> I know I've been telling y'all I need to quit singing, but yeah. I, I forget how he poured in the oil and the wine, the kind that restores my soul. He found me bleeding and dying on the Jericho Road, and he poured in the oil and the wine. Man, look, that's not, dude, that's novel, that's new. Jesus is the good Samaritan, hallelujah. He comes and he pours in the oil and the wine. He, wait, wait, where did he find you? I don't know about you, but he found me broken and bleeding and dying on the Jericho Road. And he came in and he poured in the oil and the wine. The wine is a cleanser. Come on, somebody, help me out. They didn't have alcohol back in them days. You think COVID took alcohol off the shelf? They didn't even have such a thing back then. They used wine because that was the only alcohol they had. It was a cleanser. Wine is a type of the blood of Jesus, the cross of Calvary. The blood of Jesus is your cleanser. Hallelujah. Put faith in him. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter how far you think you might have fallen, don't let the de lying devil get the best of you. There's wine for you. Hallelujah. There's cleansing for you. Hallelujah. Come to the Lord. You don't need me. You don't need me as an intercession. You have Jesus. There's one intercessor between man and God. The man Christ Jesus. You go to him wherever you are and you allow. You say, Lord, pour in the wine. I need you to cleanse me, Lord. I need to be cleansed of where, of where I am. Hallelujah. And listen, he poured in the oil. He poured in the wine and the oil. Amen. Because you know what the oil does? It's a soother. Oh, hallelujah. And the oil is a type of the Holy Spirit. Hi, Jesus. The oil is a type of the Holy Spirit and it brings the soothing of God. Yes. Amen. You might be in a place in your life right now, maybe we could get Manny and Danielle to come up and to get ready to play us, and AJ come get ready to play us a song. We're about to close. Thank you, Lord. But look, the oil of the Holy Spirit. Soothing. Hallelujah. Yes. You need some soothing in your life today? Nobody else is going to be able to soothe you like the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Amen. If you've ever been alone in the presence of God before and you felt the soothing action of the Holy Spirit, you know what I'm talking about? If you've never gotten alone with the Lord in your own time, you need to make a high, you need to learn how to you need to do it. Yeah. You, whenever there ain't nobody else around, you need to get up early in the morning time. Come on, somebody. You need to yeah. put on some worship music and you need to just start telling Jesus how much you love him.